Hello, friends. It's Jen. Welcome back to another um, installation, if you will, of uh, USA is joining us again today. We've been enjoying all of these little segments that we've been doing for you all about things that apply to transition, things that apply to this sort of seasoned spouse life. Um, and so today we're going to tackle a completely different topic that we haven't really talked about yet. And we're going to do that with um, Sean Scaturo from uh, USAA. So let me bring him on. And uh, welcome, Sean. Happy to have you here today. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So today's topic for those who are just sort of um, joining in is going to be all about SVP, which is definitely like not the thing we all want to talk about, but it's definitely the thing that I think as we look at kind of some of those pre-transition conversations yep. and financial planning conversations, like it definitely is worth being part of that dialogue. So lots of opinions on SVP, but why don't you um, first introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do at USAA, and then um, talk to a little bit about kind of the basics of SVP if someone's like, I have no idea what that is. Sure. So well, again, thanks for having me. My name is Sean Scaturo. Um, I've been with USAA for about 15 years, but been in the insurance and financial planning and financial services business for about 20. Um, I am a certified financial planner. My background with USAA, I once was a wealth manager uh, for USAA members as kind of a dedicated financial planner to about 300 families. Um, since then, I've moved into the role that I have now, which is developing and kind of creating all of USAA's advice standards. So I kind of look at it as uh, if you're riding an elevator and USAA official happens to be in the elevator, you say, hey, what do we do about XYZ topic? My job is to help kind of craft those answers. Uh, so doing a lot of the research, making certain that we have kind of our due diligence put behind it, and then formulating uh, what our official stance is on these subjects. So. When it comes to SBP, uh, we definitely have a position. We think that we have at least a rule of thumb, although with rules of thumb, uh, you know, they're not 100% accurate science in the sense of everybody's situation is gonna be different. You're gonna have you know, different uh, variables in your situation that may call for a different approach, but it's definitely a meaty topic. And um, hopefully everybody's well caffeinated because it can probably put you to sleep. <laughs> it can put you to sleep pretty easily, but uh, it is a definitely a, a meaty and, and very important topic. So, so yeah, start us at the beginning of that, if you would. So what is, um, you know, for folks who just need the basic, tell us what we need to know. So SBP, uh, let's just break down what the acronym Survivors Benefit Program or Survivor Benefit Plan. You'll kind of hear it interchanged. Uh, but what that stands for, and I, I think words have meaning. So survivors, it means that uh, you surviving somebody else benefit, meaning you're going to receive their retirement benefit. And the program is, is basically just that. Uh, but SBP is a way for you to receive um, basically a continuation of a portion of your military member's retirement plan. Perfect. And so if if folks are in this kind of pre-transition period and they're starting to think about like what their long term plan looks like and they want to mm -hmm. factor this in, like how um, I guess talk to us a little bit about the, the things that people people often under misunderstand about SPP. If we could maybe sure. we could talk about that. Yeah, I, I would say the. Um the concept of lifetime income is something that I think we can probably all wrap our heads around like social security or a military pension or any other type of pen pension. Um, and, and then there's the scary a word annuity, which isn't a scary word. I think it's one that we should probably do some better, uh, do some better branding around just that word in general, because lives, I mean, we're living longer as a, as a population, mm -hmm. we're living longer um, advancements in healthcare or better availability of healthcare. Uh, it's keeping people alive a lot longer. And so when you're working kind of against this hourglass of money, you know, you, as soon as you say, okay, I'm done working and this is the last paycheck that I'm going to receive, you turn that hourglass over and those little grains of sand of money start to pour out. That goal is to have, your goal should be to have more sand than you do time, right? Mm -hmm. You should, you should plan to have enough money to last your entire lifetime, but then you, okay, therein lies the variable. How long are you going to live? Right. What does your life expectancy look like versus your family's, you know, versus your, um, you, you know, your, your genetic longevity, all of those things. And then your own lifestyle are going to play into this decision because you're talking about money and resources for your life. Um, so by no means is it a, Hey, do this decision. And this is the right answer for every single person because, you know, you could have a difference in health. You could have a difference in desire and lifestyle. You could say, I want to, 
travel extensively and I want to spend every last dollar uh, that I have and I want my last check to bounce out loud. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I've had that conversation before. I've said that before, but it, it comes to, well, what about the people that are responsible, that I'm responsible for? What about the people that I love and, and want to make certain that after I'm gone, that they're well taken care of? And that's really where this conversation lives and breathes. It's, it's not just about what type of lifestyle you want to live. It's how do you continue the lifestyle that you want to live? How do you want to make certain that after, you know, your service member passes and, and their pension is now going to turn to you, assuming that you've taken SVP or you've done a different route, how do you ensure that the standard of living that you've grown yourself into can continue? And so that's where this conversation again lives. Um, it's not a sit down over a dinner table and, and hash it out over 30 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in my experience as a financial planner, what I've seen a lot of people do, unfortunately, they spend, you know, upwards 40 years working, whether it between a military and civilian career or, or pure civilian career. Um, and then they, they, you know, spend all that time accumulating, but then they spend maybe about a year planning for something that's going to last an equivalent amount of time. You know, if you mm. retire at 65, Average mortality for a male is about 83. Women tend to live longer, so 87. You're talking about potentially upwards of 30 year life event that we're planning only a year for. So these decisions are are vastly important. So. Yeah, no, that's a really, I like, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but it's a really interesting, um, interesting way to look at it. Cause I think you're right. And I, and, and a lot of folks that are in this sort of pre-transition period would say, well, you know, we've talked about it. We've thought about a variety of topics, like not just SBP, right? Like when JJ right. and I were on, we talked all about just in general things you want to think about, but it, it, it is a really, um, I think important point that it, it, some of those conversations are complex and they take yep. time and you don't want to feel rushed into that. And the best way to not feel rushed into that, I think is to really spend, even if you're not like, you don't have paperwork dropped, you're not like ready, you don't have a lot, you know, a calendar with a, you know, a yep. date circled on it, but still to, to start early in just digesting what's out there, what's yeah. available, what your options are going to be. So that when you are faced with like deciding where to sign, you don't feel like that's a rush decision. You feel like you have all the information. So yep. if, if folks are looking for some of that kind of back end resources for just how to understand the options, do you usually recommend that? I mean, I imagine not all financial planners are going to have the breadth of knowledge to be able to have this SVP conversation, or is that something most planners know because it exists both in corporate and in you know military? It's not unique to our environment. So you're bringing a couple of really great points up, Jen. I think that one of the first steps that you're doing is, is so I'll kind of break this down into a couple of, of numeric steps to take. Um, first is have the conversation, right? This is a, this is a personal decision. Uh, it should not be made by one individual in the household. It needs to be a family decision, right? So, um, you know, when you're making that decision, just make certain that you're having that dialogue. And I, I like what you said, Jen, about start the conversation a lot earlier than maybe if it's if it's tugging on the back of your mind, um, definitely start that dialogue. That doesn't mean that you've come to, you know, a concrete decision. You kind of maybe have it in pencil first, and then you get a little bit closer to the decision, a little bit more firm. It's written in pen and and when you, like you said, when you're ready to drop papers, it's set in stone and you're good to go. But when you're having that dialogue, you also want to start. So second piece would be start looking for reputable professionals to work with. Um, I would agree. Certified financial planners should have knowledge, maybe not to the, in, you know, to the, uh, you know, the detail of the program, but conceptually they should be aware that a pension plan exists. There is a cost element to it. There is a benefit element to it. And let's run the numbers because that's really where I think a lot of the conversation ends up going to. So the third piece is you're going to want to know what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Understand all of your sources of income, current and in retirement. You know, so if you're serving 20 and you're getting ready to retire military, are you working civilian? And if you are, what types of programs are going to be available to you there? Um, are you going to have a 401k? Does your new civilian provider offer any type of, of traditional pension? Um, and there's some differences there. A 401k is your money. You save for it. That burden is on your shoulders. I kind of say, hey, if you blow yourself up and dive everything into the stock market, your company, your, your corporation, the 401k plan, um, they kind of transfer that risk onto your shoulders where a pension says that is a benefit that is a responsibility of the organization sponsoring that pension. So there is a little bit of nuance there, but just understanding 
what do you bring to the table when you're ready to say, I'm done working entirely? Mm -hmm. So you understand your income, but then you also need to know the other side of the equation. What do you plan to spend? Are you going to increase your expenses early on because you're going to travel, see the grandkids, see other family members, or just see the world? Um, what is your lifestyle going to look like after those first five to 10 years? Like, what do you project your expenses to be? And that's where, I, again, I, I, I can't say I endorse, but I would encourage heavily you to work with a financial planner. Uh, I tend to be a snob and say certified <laughs> financial planner, <laughs> but you know, someone that knows someone that knows the science of these numbers. And then, you know, you come down to your decision matrix. So you really have three options. So if you, you know, you're making this decision, the first thing that you can do is you can do nothing. I don't really think that this is the smartest decision, but you could say, I'm not doing SBP and I'm not doing any replacement because this is a family decision. Uh, you as the spouse, uh, as well as the service member, when you're signing off on the paperwork, there's something that you basically have to disclaim it. It's mm -hmm. like an irre irrevocable beneficiary. So, um, you know, you're going to have a very fun ride home you know, with that car ride is going to be uncomfortable after you've said, uh, we're not doing anything. So again, I would say that's an option. It's not a good one. The second is, is typically our standard is we believe that you should take the full complement of the, of SBP. Um, because again, the variables around longevity, you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know what those income sources are going to look like in the future. Uh, I would kind of look at it like this. If, if you're heavily invested in the stock market, and the stock market dives and mm -hmm. just goes away entirely. And I, I'm being hyperbolic here sure. for purpose that there's no money available in stocks anymore. The worst case scenario is that you still have a pension, the SBP plan kicking and going. So you kind of build in a floor that this is my worst case scenario and can I adjust my lifestyle to that? Um, so we tend to lean on the direction of, of going with SBP. The last option and this is something that it goes into a little bit more of the, the kind of the devil in the details and finding out the right approach, but using an alternative approach, typically using life insurance. Mm -hmm. So SPP costs 6.5% of whatever the retirement pay is. And that gets you a maximum of 55% of the, of that pension amount. So a thousand dollars, it's about 65 bucks a month, but it's going to generate $550 for the, for that month, for the rest of life. And you can scale it accordingly, you know, 4,000 do the math. Um, you can also scale down, but that six and a half percent for 55% is the max threshold. And, and I tend to lean because I'm a, I'm a little bit more conservative. I tend to lean on that direction or at least have historically with members that I've worked through this decision with when you're looking at that number. So you can say 6.5% equals X. I'm going to go and buy Y amount of life insurance for that dollar amount. This is where it gets a little bit more important because you're talking about a permanent risk. You know, you're know, you eventually going to, because we all do, you're going to pass away, right? Death and taxes, two things we know to be certain. <laughs> um, so when you're looking at your alternatives, is it wise to go through and buy you know, this, to protect this risk with temporary life insurance or term life insurance mm -hmm. that you're mm -hmm. likely going to outlive? Right. Um, you know, and then the alternative is, well, okay, if I don't buy term, I'm gonna buy potentially a whole life or a universal life, some type of permanent life insurance. And then it's, well, how the heck does that thing work? So, you know, understanding all of these comparatives, mm -hmm. it's really important to, to, first of all, kind of tug on your own heartstrings. What makes you feel most comfortable? What are you going to feel most safe with when it comes to the risk of potentially either running out of money or not having enough resources in retirement following, you know, a, a survivor event? Um, where are you going to be best served? And then you can start making more of the mathematical you know, equations to add to that decision. So if emotionally you say, hey, look, nothing's going to make me feel more comfortable than having that guaranteed amount of lifetime income, your decision's kind of made. Yeah, right. And if, and, and if it's, hey, well, let's find out what the real value is and let's see how much would it take to get a life insurance policy to replace that pension amount? Um, or maybe it's, Hey, you know, as a survivor, I'm going to be fine because I've got, you know, maybe it's a teacher's pension or some other type mm -hmm. of pension, or I've got social security that's pretty heavy, or I've done my due diligence and I've saved. So all of those things come into, well, the, the question, well, what should I do? It depends. <laughs> I know. Everybody hates so that a, answer, but it's a, it's so, it's a fence it's writing answer, but it, it is the truth.
Well, and I was curious as you're talking about that, that, that like that third option, because I hear that a lot, you know, the, the replacement piece. The other thing I hear a lot um, is around the idea of kind of going back to not waiting is if you do, you know, if you have the conversation early and you do want to pursue you know, let's say you decide that option three is the, makes the most sense for you, mm -hmm. then the earlier you start that and the earlier you get that policy, yes, like potentially you're paying on it longer, but it might be a lot cheaper because you're not, you know, 45 or you're not, you know, you don't have ailments that might pop up later or have a disability yeah. rating that makes it impossible to get that coverage. So I think that's another really like wrinkle to that third piece is the timing of it when often yeah. we don't have that conversation till the end of that retirement stage. Definitely. And so what you're what you're really hitting on, Jen, is is just the dialogue around how do you protect yourself and kind of your your navigation going forward. So I mean, if if everything is a roadmap and you're trying to stay on course, one of those things early on, especially when you're in your, you know, maybe that's the the first you know, your military retirement before civilian, um, that transition going from military where you have things like SGLI in place, and then that decision of converting over to do I take VGLI? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that the wisest decision? But that's really the life insurance conversation of I'm trying to protect my family's lifestyle and the things that they're accustomed to. I always look at it for my own family. So I've got three kids. I'm married. If I died yesterday, I want them to be able to go to the same school. I want them to have the house paid off. I want them to be able to have college paid for. So while those needs are, are huge boulders, you know, those are things that I, that I hold near and dear to me. I also recognize they're temporary. My kids, pray God, they're going to get older and get out of my house and, and eventually go on to school and become successful, functional people in society. Um, I'll pay off my mortgage and eventually I'll retire. So my, my thought process around life insurance is what kind of insurance policy do I need for today? And how does that benefit me with either features or options or different types of choices that I can make down the run? Because you're touching on something that's, that's again, a variable. I can't control my health beyond the things that I, I can control. I can, mm -hmm. you know, eat right. I can exercise, you know, and I can make good, healthy habit decisions. But sometimes things come up, you know, health changes and we can't really control all of those variables. Same thing for our service members. If you're in great health right now, um, you know, take that for what it's worth. If you're if you're still in service, having that opportunity to lock in your health really takes away the concern of all of those things that could change that prevent you from having those, mm -hmm. those kind of happy path solutions for your retirement and kind of ongoing life going forward. So it, it's it's definitely one of those things that where if you're looking at the life insurance conversation as a component to SVP, life insurance can grow and change with you over time. There are more, and I don't want to ever besmirch VGLI. I think it's a great solution, but there tends to be more advantageous benefits by private life insurance mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at something like a conversion feature. So we know budget. I know budget kind of cash is king, tends to rule all of our decisions. Um, if it's in your budget to afford term life insurance right now and permanent life insurance is a little bit on the back burner because the cost is a little bit more expensive, mm -hmm. typically term life insurance from a private provider can be converted over into a permanent life insurance policy at usually more favorable rates, more favorable costs than what VGLI offers. Mm. So again, it's another kind that. of wrinkle in the dialogue. Yeah. So most term policies can be swapped over. It, it, oh. What it basically does is it says, hey, you bought this term policy when you're in your young 30s. You mm -hmm. were in good health, you know, no cholesterol issues, no other issues. That gave you the best rating that the insurance company was offering. That rating stays with you. So when you're converting your policy, oh. they're going to say, you don't need to go through a medical exam. You don't need to answer any health questions. We're looking at your health from back then. The only thing that's changing is we're looking at your age of today. Sure. Okay. Uh, my, my gray beard says I'm older than I was 20 <laughs> years ago, right? I can't change that. But because I have a term policy, I can swap over into a permanent policy and say, okay, my needs for life insurance have changed. I once was thinking about my mortgage as my biggest risk. Now I'm thinking about the amount of lifetime income mm -hmm. that my wife is dependent on. You know, that if I were to pass away, I want to make certain it's there for her. And I didn't do SBP because I had this insurance policy. I'm going to need to convert that because I don't know when, you know, when our maker's calling us up, I don't know when I'm going to pass away. And I want to make certain that that risk is taken off the table. 
Yeah, that's a really, I did not know that. That's a really interesting piece. Um, now I got to dig into that one for myself. So that's <laughs> that's always helpful. Um, you mentioned VGLI and I'm, I imagine mm -hmm. folks know what that is, but if you can just take a quick step back and then I think we're, we're probably almost ready to wrap up here. But, um, and if folks have any specific questions, feel free to throw those in the chat um, or in the comments. Um, but I was curious if you could just kind of level set for everybody yeah. what VGLI is and how it's different from the SGLI. Definitely. So SGLI Service Members Group Life Insurance, that's basically $29 um, out of your pay to get $400,000 of life insurance. And then you have additional family benefit. Um, it's part of the TSGLI program or the FSGLI program. Um, VGLI kind of looks at it as a mirror for that program after you've separated from service. So there's a window of time where when you've separated and you've lost your SGLI, that you can convert over to VGLI, usually without having to go through any type of medical underwriting or good health statement. Um, so with no questions, you can get VGLI. Again, there is a certain window of time. Best resource is going on to the VGLI information page on va.gov. Uh, but VGLI is Veterans Group Life Insurance. It's your life insurance through a group, and I'm gonna underline that word, uh, group for after your SGLI is, has been um, expired. Now, Veterans Group Life Insurance works differently. SGLI is a flat cost. You know, so the same cost that you had from your, your first day in service to the last day of service, it's, it's basically the same dollar amount unless they change the rate for the entire group. Where VGLI is a group life insurance rate. So your good health individuals, poor health individuals, they're all mashed together. So the rates are not going to be favorable for those that have really great health. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be unfavorable for those that really have questionable health mm -hmm. or have different habits. So like I said earlier, there's some benefit there. There's a lot of kind of peace of mind. The difference is VGLI will have a cost change in five-year increments. At 35, that price will be different than when you're 40. Same thing at 45. 50, 65, and, and not to knock it, it gets pretty cost prohibitive mm -hmm. as you gain an age mm -hmm. where the difference, so kind of to level set, the difference of a, in most cases, a standard term policy offered by a private insurance carrier is you'll see what you call a level term where when you buy it, the rate that you bought on day one typically la or is, is fixed for as long as the guarantee period lasts. So let's say for 30 years, you were paying 20 bucks a month for you know, a term policy through a private insurer, even when you, if you bought it at 35, even that last month at 65, you're looking at still paying that same $20 a month. So when you're working against a scale that goes up versus one that goes flat, there's going to be this difference in between. And that's really what you're going to want to compare and making that decision of, should I go VGLI mm -hmm. or should I go with a private life insurance policies is where is the biggest bang for my buck? Um, a lot of times, you know, unfortunately in the, the business that we are, especially working with military members, can you get private life insurance, mm -hmm. you know, um, right. being that we're USA, I would love to pat ourselves on the back for trying to say yes more often, but there are circumstances, you know, just where life insurance isn't something that we can offer. Same thing. Other insurance companies may not be able to offer VGLI becomes that path. Um, you know, it's, it's again, within that window of time of separation, you're looking at having guaranteed offered life insurance to you through the VGLI program, but you're going to want to again do your due diligence, do your cost comparison, and think about features and benefits like we talked about with SPP, how mm -hmm. those conversations link together. I need it for this need now. My needs are going to change over that 30 years until I'm ready to say I'm done working. How do I get the best policy that covers kind of both of those spectrums of my life? Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that because I think that that's sort of, I mean, that's a great way to sort of bring it all together. I feel like there's a lot of spreadsheets in my future, <laughs> like, <laughs> trying to, you know, trying to sort it out and wanting to yeah. sort of turn over all the stones to, and you know, to your point, it really much, it very much is like this, this crystal ball of sorts because you really don't know. And right. so you're just sort of mitigating risks as best you can and going with yeah. the, whatever solution makes the most sense based on your objectives. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of number crunching that's going to have to happen before we actually feel like, OK, we we are confident in this decision. We know we're making the right choice for our circumstances. Um, and I imagine for everyone else, too. It's probably why a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to think about it because it just yeah. it's kind of overwhelming to feel it like I have made the right choice because there are so many variables. Yeah. So, well, Jen, you're using some really important words. You said we, our 
right? <laughs> this is a family decision. Don't make this decision by one person only. Like it, it's, it needs to be a couple decision because you're talking about dependencies and you're talking about life. So make certain that you're, uh, even if it's uncomfortable, mm -hmm. put your head down, talk about it, have that dialogue. It will, it will drive your decisions more so than, uh, than just cost. Cost is probably yeah. the worst thing to look at because it's myopic. Look at first, like, what's the emotion? What's the thing that's going to provide you the greatest sense of value? Because cost is is only an objection when you don't see the value in it. So that's it. I, yeah. That's that's no, my that's piece perfect. on it. I'm getting that's, off my soapbox. <laughs> no, you're like, we brought you on for your soapbox. It's perfect. Right. It's exactly <laughs> what you're supposed to do. I was just going to put up JJ's little tip here about looking at um, the all the transition tools that USAA provides over at USAA.com. Um, there's, uh, he'd mentioned this one, ETS, uh, slash ETS, as well as, um, slash life. So two great resources for anyone who's in this transition phase, or even in this pre-transition phase, I think we've sort of established that there's no harm in, in doing a little homework ahead of time so that you feel well prepared to ask the right questions. Cause often I think it's just knowing what questions to ask to get the information that's going to help you have that confidence in your decision. Definitely. And if you think this conversation is fun, talk about healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no. I look. <laughs> I'm looking at Jen. I'm like, no, Jen. We don't have. We don't have anybody's. Like the audience does not have the appetite for that today. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we will lose them all. But we do appreciate you hanging out with us. It's all, these have been really fun and informative, and I feel like I've learned a little something from each one. Which you know, I hope um, our audience feels the same. So thank you, Sean, for hanging out with us. Hey, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Yep. All right, guys, that's it for this installment. We are going to probably take a, a small break from our lives, but we're working on potentially doing these a little bit more often on the topics that are interesting to you around transition, around pre-transition, around all of the things that we've been talking about for the last few months here at Pride and Grit. So thank you for hanging out with us and uh, we will catch you next time.